Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on inclusive learning. I'm delighted we have two speakers with us today um, who will be speaking back to back, followed by some time for questions. If you would like to ask any questions, you're experts by now, just ask them on the app um, or there's some support at the back if you would like some help with that. Delighted to welcome our first speaker today, Dr. Alyssa Alcorn, who's going to be talking about learning and teaching about neurodiversity at school sustainably and over time. Over to you, Alyssa. Thank you, Katie. So I'm Dr. Alyssa Alcorn, and some of you know me, some of you know me quite well, and have heard me speak about Leans a number of times. Um, I'm from the University of Edinburgh, based at the Salveson Mind Room Research Center, but today, I'm actually representing a much larger team of researchers and educators, people from the Salveson Mind Room Center, our Leans champions, so everything you're gonna hear today is really a team effort from a very large number of people. So thank you all for everything that you've done to make this project happen. So I want to start by a little uh, self-congratulation, which is we had an exciting birthday on the 1st of March and this project turned three years old. Um, we're old enough to you know, start running around and asking why questions and that sort of thing. And, and so today's talk is gonna be looking back a bit at what we have done so far up to now in the project, but also toward the future, what is happening in the very last phase of the project as we kind of transition into something new. So it's day two of Viticom, and obviously this is kind of a, a specialized conference. So I think everyone here is fairly likely to agree generally what neurodiversity and neurodivergence are about and also that these are really useful and important explanatory concepts for understanding ourselves and others in groups that we're a part of. Um, also that public understanding is, uh, is low, to put it politely, of any of these issues. And finally, that far, far too many children, neurodivergent, neurotypical, all children, they're often having poor experiences at school, and that is not right. And all of these things together are kind of the starting point for the Leans project. Also, the idea that knowledge and attitudes matter. There is a body of research that suggests that poor understanding of neurodivergence and people's experiences and needs, negative attitudes, all of this can kind of compound the challenges that neurodivergent pupils are already facing. So what people all around think matters. There is some good news here, which is that there's other research showing that we can do something about stigma and poor understanding and negative attitudes. Um, and that's been shown successfully specifically in schools and even over a fairly short period of time. And broadly, this is the strategy that the Leans Project takes. So I said Leans, 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 Leans a number of times. And this stands for learning about neurodiversity at school. And we've really tried to stick to doing what we say on the box about this project. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview. So LEANS is both a research project and a package of classroom resources. And this is about introducing neurodiversity concepts in a way that's accessible and engaging and age appropriate. The best thing about LEANS is that it is all completely free and available for download anywhere in the world right now. And our target age group for LEANS is toward the end of primary school. So about age eight to 11 years, kind of running up toward that secondary transition. And a really important point is that LEANS is for the entire class. It's not something where you're pulling out specific pupils. It is about everyone, the class and the teacher, upskilling together. And it also has some links to existing curriculum topics and priorities. Currently, it's very, very uncommon for schools to directly be teaching about neurodiversity, though that is starting to change. I've had some really encouraging conversations within Scotland, like with Borders Council and Falkirk Council, um, trying to put neurodiversity kind of more explicitly on the agenda. So things are slowly starting to change here. But even in places where it's not yet on the agenda, there's some clear links to things that schools are already prioritizing or trying to prioritize, um, like around inclusion and diversity, pupil well-being and health and safety, but also topics like citizenship and human rights. So the big goal of the LEANS program is about creating positive change at school. So if a class has gone through this program, at the end, we want pupils and teachers to increase their knowledge of neurodiversity terms and concepts. But we also want to create more positive attitudes towards 
neurodiversity, and neurodivergent people. Finally, perhaps most importantly, we want to change what people do. We want to promote more positive, inclusive actions within the school community. So we talk about these as our know, think, and do goals for the LEANS program. Oh, come on. So I've mentioned the, the program a number of times, but it's not just a giant monolithic blob. We, it's broken down into topic units, and as you might expect, we start with a unit on introducing neurodiversity and neurodiversity terms. Then go along to talk about experiences in the classroom with, with different types of lessons, different parts of the school environment, talk about sensory issues, uh, communication and miscommunication, including my favorite phrase, you're not listening. Um, talking about needs and wants and linking those up to the idea of classroom supports and who gets to access what at school. Fairness and unfairness, another, another favorite of the uh, 8 to 11 year old age group. Friendships, relationships, and a finally sort of action and reflection oriented unit trying to help classes put what they've talked about into practice for the future. So in putting together that list, it may leave out some things you might expect to see there. And our guiding principle all the way along during the development phase is talking about what are ways that kids in this age group at school experience the implications of being in a neurodiverse group of people. What's that actually like? So in order to get at those experiences, what do we need to talk about? And the answer is not loads of neurons. There's one neuron in leans. This is it, this illustration right here. Um, sorry to any neuroscientists in the audience. <laughs> Instead, we spend a lot of time talking about this. I love this illustration. Uh, lots of time talking about, that's not fair. How come he gets to do it and I don't? It's your fault. You're wrong. Um, and you're not listening. You know, all of these sort of points of friction that are happening all day long in interactions in the school environment. And you know, how, how are some of these sometimes traceable back to our differences? And how can neurodiversity and neurodivergence sometimes be an explanation for some of these types of things that we see happening day to day in the school environment? So each of the units that I mentioned has different types of stuff. Um, we've got a small number of videos, and these are really about directly explaining tricky new concepts and vocabulary so that the teachers in the audience are not on the spot coming up with an age-appropriate definition of neurodiversity. Most of what's in Leans, though, is all about hands-on activities and discussions. This is about getting your hands dirty and seeing, ah, you know, I experienced this for myself. I saw this is true in my classroom. Like, this, this is really happening. However, we then pair those with story content about a fictional neurodiverse class. And I know we've got someone in the audience whose class loved the story so much that apparently they're going to write to me and ask for more stories. So I suppose I better be ready to do some more typing. Um, and these are all about illustrating individual perspectives, getting inside the heads of characters to see really what they're experiencing during a particular activity or an interaction with another person. It lets us be, be personal, be specific, but without calling on individual pupils to have to disclose personal information about themselves that they may not want to do or may have unintended consequences. So some key facts about this program for schools and teachers. And the first one is that teachers don't need to already be neurodiversity experts to get started with this program. We developed it with the assumption that people may be interested in neurodiversity but may not necessarily know a lot. So it should have everything you need to get started right there in the materials, along with, you know, we picked the brains of our neurodiverse team of people to try to put in as much advice as possible into the resource pack. There is also not a required training course, which I know can kind of be a bottleneck sometimes. The teacher handbook is really meant to be a course in a book with everything you need. It is important to keep in mind that, you know, Leans is a time investment. Our current estimate is about one to two hours a week spread over a school term that you could spread it over a longer period of time. So that's about 15 to 19 hours total delivery. It will vary depending on your class and if you do the optional bits. Um, so I do really want to stress, especially if you talk to others about Leans, all the materials, all the content completely free, but it is a time investment to deliver this program because it's a sensitive topic. We're talking about people's lives. 
And I do want to stress that because it is a sensitive topic and because it is a time investment, it won't be the right tool everywhere right now. But the teacher handbook has a lot of guidance to help people decide if it might be a good fit for you in your school. So to rewind a little bit, I've mentioned our design team and I've mentioned our development. We started with a blank page for Leans pretty much. We had some very unusual funding from the um, Scientific Advisory Board at the Salveson Mind Room Research Center. So started with questions like, what does teaching about neurodiversity even mean for this age group? What are our learning objectives? What kind of stuff are we like writing a book or making a board game or what are we doing here? And it was up to our team of educators and researchers working together to try to answer these questions. And Leans is the answer. And we got a lot more input along the way through consultation studies with even more teachers and community members. Leans also went to school quickly in 2021, um, asking about feasibility of the program, accessibility for pupils and teachers, safety, and then also impact. Were kids actually learning new stuff about neurodiversity? Did their attitudes change? And I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our study schools for doing this during COVID uh, or as soon as they were back after COVID. So we had eight classes participating, um, one needed to withdraw. So we had about 140 children complete the program. 62 of those had opt in consent to share their data with the researchers. Um, they did some quizzes before and after leans. And we also collected some qualitative data. I see that I need to speed up a little bit here. The very, very headline findings, I'm leaving lots out, everybody, are that we didn't find any major feasibility or acceptability issues, but we did get lots of practical feedback to improve the resources and implement it as much as we could. We did not find evidence of new safety issues or evidence of harms from any of the information available to us, which was really important. And finally, we did find, using statistics, evidence of changes to children's knowledge and attitudes and the types of actions that they thought were, were gonna be good actions in their classroom and in interacting with others. So that was all very positive for us. Come on. Um, one quick reflection from a teacher, it was hard to pick just one to include. Um, she wrote, I think that studying leans genuinely made an impact on the class. Individual children appeared to have a penny drop moment. I think it helped children to have a better understanding of the way others are slash feel and also why learning can be different and is delivered differently to them. And this one reflection captures so much of what we really hoped to do with the program. So that was wonderful to see that. We released Jean Leans last June um, with a big online launch event. Thank you so much to all of you who tuned in for that. Um, and I'm really happy to share we've had over 3,400 downloads from 58 countries, which is amazing for this late. Yeah, Fergus is right. Flaplaz for that one. Because um, it's been such a shoestring project in many ways. So thank you so much to all who have checked out Leans. I'm going to skip the summary because I'm running out of time a little bit. And I want to tell you about the community stuff. The community. The community is really important to what we're doing now. Because often after you release a resource like the Package of Lean's Classroom Resources, uh, you've run off a cliff. Uh, often at this point, the funding is finished, the thing is released, the staff move on to other projects, and there's nobody really there to continue uh, answering questions, providing support, promoting things. It falls off the radar, it gathers dust, and we really, really did not want that to happen with leans because neurodivergent people are not going anywhere. Our work is still unfinished here in terms of what we're trying to do. So that leads us to the Lean C Community Impact Project, which is a partnership between my lab and the Salveson Mind Room Center. And this was about trying to make sure that those things did not happen. Leans will stay online past the end of our funding, it will stay available, but we also hope that people will continue to find out about it, to choose to use it in their schools over time, to share it with others. And for that to happen, we are gonna need support options and dissemination that are not fully reliant on the research team, that are not mainly reliant on me, to be perfectly accurate about that. Um, and our strategy about that has been to try to move specialized leans knowledge and momentum and tools out into the wider community as far as possible. So we've got two strands there, and the first one is about educators and our Leans Champions program. I'm very happy that we have some champions here at the conference. This is all about educators, supporting educators to give 
personalized support because that wasn't previously available. It was all kind of generic. But this is where you can contact another educator and tell them about your situation at your school and get their advice. Maybe you're troubleshooting. Maybe you're trying to convince a head teacher that this could support goals you already have. Um, champions can give you that kind of advice. And they are incredibly generous volunteers. Their support is completely free. And I wanted to share a great example of what our Welsh champions were doing just last week, Alan Flynn and Becky Morgan. And they ran a Microsoft Teams workshop with 26 teachers from nine schools in Wales, which is super. And Becky shared that all attendees were very positive about the materials. We'd given them some pre-attendance activities to complete. It seemed that most intended to run with leans, though they appreciated there was some planning involved. We'll meet with them again in June to discuss progress and share experiences. And that's very clever, and I will steal that from Alan and Becky and recommend that to others, that they build in that kind of additional follow-up and support point if they're spreading the word. So this is just one example of something that champions are doing in their local area to help other teachers understand neurodiversity issues and consider whether they could be bringing that into their curriculum. So if you're an education professional and are thinking, oh, maybe I, could, maybe I could chat to a champion, you can. All of the information is online. Um, if you can find it on our website or scan this QR code. Our other strand of the Lean C project, the Lean's Community Project, is all about parent and carer power. Because you know who are incredibly passionate, often very well-informed advocates? Families, that is who. And they can help get neurodiversity teaching on school agendas. They're coming at it from a different angle than researchers like myself, or sometimes even than educators. So in order to help give them some tools to do that, um, the SMC team led on developing a set of companion resources that go along the side of the Leans program. This is not a Leans for home use or a Leans for parents. It's some additional bits that go with the school program. The first part is an info booklet for families that's trying to explain the issues in a way that's meant to be as accessible as it could be and answer questions about, like, what might this mean for my child, especially if my child is neurodivergent, if the class did this a template letter to help them propose leans to their child's school, and also an info booklet for schools. They can send with that letter to make it as easy as possible for schools to get an idea of what the program is all about and hopefully send them to the website for all the details. Um, the staff at SMC can also share this if it's appropriate with families as part of their direct support conversation. So we really appreciate them considering that as an option. So some initial feedback from these resources. Um, someone shared that it was valuable and easy to use resource that approaches neurodiversity through such a positive lens. Just having the resources slash knowledge to talk to my school about leans is helpful. I find it a very smart approach to promote awareness and the implementation of this tool by circulating to schools, teachers, et cetera, through the parents. So great to hear some initial positive comments there. These resources, while they're aimed at families and schools, anyone can download them and use them. They're also free, and they're available from the Salveson Mind Room Center website, the link from the main lean site. Everything is linked to everything else. You can find what you need. So I'd like to close by posing two community challenges. I hope everyone has had their coffee and is feeling ready for two challenges, OK? So the first one is to share. Uh, this is not like sharing, like preschool sense of sharing, but more in the sense of everybody can be an influencer. Sharing and signposting, making a personal recommendation to someone can be so incredibly powerful, especially when there's so much information just kind of bludgeoning us all the time. And it, it doesn't matter what role you're in. And so, so to just remember that you can sometimes convince someone by taking the time to recommend a resource, a book, a training course, whatever it is that is neurodiversity positive. The second challenge is about networks. Um, and this one is really about there isn't yet a place for people in different professions or people in different regions to meet others who are interested in bringing neurodiversity teaching into schools, to talk to them, to share tips, to join forces. So I'm asking whether any of you might be able to take a step to start a venue for people in your profession or your community to talk about neurodiversity and schools. 
And this is a place where all of us on the Lean C team talked about this quite a lot and looked at different options and ultimately decided that we were not the ones who should own any kind of network or platform, that this really needed to be community led if it was gonna be useful and if it was gonna be sustainable over time. It could be as simple as making a Facebook group uh, or making an email list, but I'd encourage you to have a think if you care about this topic, if there's a way you could start connecting other people um, to build some momentum and help each other out and talk about it. So finally, there is an opportunity to meet not only me, but many other Lean's team members today at lunchtime downstairs in the hub. We're running the Research Cafe. We're at Stand End, which is on the left toward the back as you come in. Uh, we even have some free stuff in addition to a million zillion Lean's leaflets. Um, you, especially if you're listening online and you can't come by the cafe, you can also join our mailing list to get project news. I am too busy to spam you. So we mostly stick to trying to announce events and when we've got new stuff for people to look at. Finally, I would like to say again, an enormous thank you to everyone who has supported this project in any way. It has been a really huge effort. You're welcome to get in touch with the project or with me by email, or the giant QR code is our website. Our website is like the Bible of Leans. Everything is on the website. So if you'd like more information, please do visit us downstairs or go online. Thank you very much for joining me today. Alyssa, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan of Lean, so it was a pleasure to hear you talk. And now moving swiftly on to our next speaker. Um, delighted to welcome Dr. Jamie Marshall, um, who's come here today to prove to us that Scotland is never too cold to go surfing. <laughs> Um, he's going to be speaking about Off to the Beach Surf Therapy. Hi, everyone. Um, that's exactly the reaction I got back in 2014 when I was trying to convince East Lothian Council to let me take kids into the beach and it was going to be good for them. Um, so, yeah, um, thank you for having me. Thank you. I want to say a big thank you to uh, Itacom for having me. I actually met Sophie on Bellhaven, which is a beach down in Dunbar, just down the road. Um, and it was just a wonderful chance to, to show what we were doing down there. Um, but yeah, today I want to just talk to you a little bit about surf therapy and uh, a point that I've been trying to explore and, and discuss is the question of, is it actually about the surfing? You know, what's actually happening here? So first of all, me. Um, I sort of, there's, there's lots of stuff here about my research background and things, but I just thought I'd like to draw out two little points. So I actually don't come from, I haven't been at university for sort of all my life. I, I set up and ran the Wave Project, which is an incredible organization uh, in, in Scotland. I set the Scottish branch up, I didn't set the whole thing up. Um, just down the road in East Lothian, they also have a branch up in Fife now in St Andrews. If you are locally based, please do Google them, have a look, go down, get involved. They're always looking for volunteers. They're always looking for partner organizations to work with. And they do amazing work with youth mental health. At that point, just to position myself as well, because as a researcher, I'm not someone who works exclusively with neurodiverse populations. I work in a much broader sort of mental health paradigm, um, especially because a lot of my work is actually focused in the Global South and LMICs. I'm sorry, I'm dyslexic, so I always trip over that one in particular. Um, but it's really interesting because in those, in those areas, the kind of projects that I work with are often the first or one of the only port of calls in those communities for neurodiverse individuals. Um, and while it shouldn't necessarily be that everything's put together like that, when it's the only option, sometimes we need to try and optimize that as best as we can. Um, so, yeah, and the other thing just to mention is I'm the health and social impact lead at Lost Shore, which is an amazing surf park coming to Edinburgh in 2025. That's the only blatant plug, I promise. So, I want to start with this picture. Um, this is a picture of a young lad down at the Wave Project just down the road. What's going on there? Okay, if, if I show you that picture in isolation without any of the stuff we're going to talk about now, does that look like positive mental health? Does that look like a learning experience? Does that, I mean, a... Uh, yeah, it doesn't look great to me. That's one of those pictures you're like, do I want to put that on the Instagram feed? <laughs> you know, that's one of those pictures that makes those people from East Lothian Council go, yeah, called it. Um, <laughs> and that's why I like to show this picture, because in isolation, it's potentially a little bit worrying. In isolation, it's a little bit what's going on there. Um, but we're going to try and put some frame around that to understand why that picture is actually quite cool. Um, so yeah, what is going on? And just a little bit about me as a researcher, um, 
I, I recently finished, or re I say recently, uh, I finished a PhD a year ago exploring the mechanisms in surf therapy. Surf therapy is a phenomenon that's really grown around the world. And this map here is very simply just a, a, a list of the organizations I've worked with. And just to draw out why some are blue and some are red, the blue ones are all surf therapies, they're all surfing organizations. And the red items are actually organizations that are working with different sports as modality. So as my research has expanded, we sort of, we've left the beach a little bit and we're trying to see what we've learned from the beach, how does it apply in different contexts. And there's just some really amazing organizations to draw out. Um, in particular, you can see uh, just the difference from the surfing ones. You've got Climate in the Lebanon that do amazing work and actually have like a mobile climbing wall that they drive into the refugee camps, which is just really cool. Um, and Elm and Peace there in Somalia, who are doing just incredible work in one of the most challenging sort of spaces in the world. It's just, it's a privilege to work with all these people, is basically what I, I often spend half my talk saying. Um, just incredible organizations, and I am just a researcher who's trying to help them explain what's going on. Um, and the majority of my work was based around grounded theory because when we were looking at this, we found that the theory didn't exist. We didn't know. We, we were seeing these positive impacts of certain sporting programs, and in particular the surfing programs, but we didn't know what was going on. And I mean, that's an issue. You wouldn't prescribe a drug if you didn't know how it was working, would you? So it was a priority for us to try and understand. And to do that, we used grounded theory, so basically lots of interviews with lots of people. And this is my PhD in a slide, um, which always feels a bit like, is that it? Um, but yeah, this is my PhD in a slide. Just to explain it very briefly, we had some core mechanisms that we found across multiple sites. So these things that seem to be entrenched in whatever form of, of physical activity or, or surfing was going on. Um, we had some contextual mechanisms that were very much specific to sp certain populations or certain areas. Um, and everything was framed in this idea of population-specific tailoring. If you want to serve any population, whether it's a neurodiverse population, whether it's a trauma population, whatever it may be, if you do not understand that population, you will not run an effective intervention. Sounds like common sense, but it's really surprising how often the common sense principles don't have the research to back them up. So this is what we found. Um, and today, I could do 20 minutes, I could do more than 20 minutes on just each line there. And today, I really want to focus on the one I've got in italics there, which is physical and emotional safe spaces. Um, the reason it's in italics is not because I'm talking about today, it was in italics in my PhD too. We found that physical and emotional safe spaces were foundational to all of the other mediators and mechanisms within the programs. So basically, if you did not establish a physical and emotional safe space within your, your program, whatever sport you're using, whatever, you know, wherever in the world you are, your, the other mediators weren't possible and therefore the outcomes that were associated were not possible. Um, so just to give you some, some context of where this, this research comes from, grounded theory, to sum it up very much, your theory is grounded in the data you've got. So this is just some raw data straight there. You'll note some of it is from different populations. Um, but what I like to draw out is this concept of a surf family. Every single site I went around the world, working with adults, working with young people, working with neurodivergent populations, working with, um, who have I got up there? Um, up the top there's a US Marine struggling with PTSD. Every single population I worked with described the group they were meeting at the beach as their surf or beach family. Now that's an incredibly powerful correlation given what family actually means. As a, as a, as a, a social species, our family is supposed to be our primary support structure, our primary emotional physical support structure. A lot of the time, you know, families don't quite work out like that for, for a variety of reasons. And, I mean, I don't want to bore you all with the basics of attachment theory, but, but we understand that can have a catastrophic effect on, you know, how we go about our daily lives, how we, how we function, how we do anything. Um, and for that comparison to be made for these, you know, group of strangers that you've met on the beach for a couple of weeks, potentially, to suddenly become an, an, an adjunct family is, is incredibly powerful. And when I say it was at every site, it wasn't like it was mentioned once or twice at every site. It was in over 50, 60% of the interviews I did across the whole of my PhD, which just says something about that. Um, I, don't, I don't want to read quotes out individually. <coughs> but actually, that led us to another question, because when we started identifying this concept of a physical and emotional safe space, I did what any good researcher does, and I went back to the literature. And the literature 
had a damning lack of definition of that terminology. That term is used all the time in all kinds of policy papers, things like this. When I was looking for it in a sort of sport for development context as I, as I exist in, there were one or two papers that maybe gave a kind of definition and that was it. And it, the other point to make about that is most of those definitions were being made potentially by experts, and yes, they are potentially qualified experts, but no one had actually spoken to the individuals who needed these physical and emotional safe spaces, who, who appreciated them the most. So what I'm sharing with you today, actually, you are the first people in the world to see this. I finished collecting this data on Wednesday. So um, I, I live on the Outer Hebrides, so on a very bumpy, very small plane. We joke that we have to, you know, I only make it when we rub, um, wind the rubber band up enough. Um, but on a very bumpy plane, I was trying to get this analyzed so I could present it to you. And if I hadn't got it analyzed, this would have been a much shorter presentation. Um, but yeah, we, we worked with those organizations around the world. And this is actually a coach perspective. And the next stage of the study is going to be sort of trying to confirm or, or member check that with participants. But a coach perspective of what safe spaces actually entail. Um, and I don't think any of you are going to disagree with anything up there. And I don't think anything up there is especially revolutionary. But the process we've gone through to get it is the important part. This is now sort of robustly evidence-based. Um, well, obviously, I need to get it published and everything first. But, but we need more of this going on. We need to take these concepts, which I think people are sort of taking for granted. We need to take them. We need to define them. And we need to sort of back them up in a, in a robust manner. And that's what we did here. Um, so yeah, these are the sorts of things that we found. And alongside just looking at the characteristics of case, uh, safe spaces, we looked at the characteristics for coaching behaviors, so that the kind of coaching behaviors that enabled safe spaces. And again, just to, this is uh, five of 26 recommendations. We built consensus up amongst all those coaches around the world. Um, and I just wanted to, I want to draw out a couple of them here because we're then going to explore them in a surfing context. So what does that actually look like? These all look good as recommendations, but then we need to apply them. Um, so sport, sport is an interesting one. And um, I've mentioned sport for development a few times. I hate that term. Okay, the reason is because the sport comes first. The sport should never come first. There is a, a, there's been a problem for the last 50 years that we have thought, and there, there are people who when I say this, get very upset. Um, I thought sport had this romantic thing that you can drop sport in, it makes everything better. I'm afraid that's nonsense. Um, sport can actually do, there's a, there's a great paper um, by a, a friend of mine who, who basically demonstrated if you drop sport into a post-conflict zone with no structures around it, it can actually make things worse because the teams reaffirm around the same sort of structures that they were experiencing in the conflict and actually mental health markers went significantly down. So we need to move away from this romantic concept of sport being good in and of itself. Physical activity is different for those of you who were in the keynote earlier. Yes, physical activity has been demonstrated to have an effect. But physical activity is only useful if people do it and they do it regularly. Okay? And if our sport is not a safe space, they're not going to do it regularly. So we've got these ideas around managing competitive elements, classic one. I um, I was very small when I was, when I was younger. I loved rugby. Suddenly, at age of 13, everyone got a lot bigger. Um, I couldn't compete at the level I wanted to anymore. Got completely ostracized from that sport, which I still love. The weekend was very painful for me. Um, but yeah, you know, th there's a very basic example in my life of what it looks like. Um, you know, mis re reframing mistakes. One of my favorite surf coaches always talks about the first thing you learn surfing is how to fall. You can't just, you know, it's how you get off a surfboard. Um, but just have a look at what that looks like in surfing. Surfing is a, is a vehicle, and it's a very good vehicle, but it's by no means anything special. It's no, it's no silver bullet. The reason surfing does work quite well is, look here, this is Belhaven down the road, looking much sunnier than it did yesterday. Um, but we spend hours, weeks, working with people in ankle depth water, and that's fine. You know, If that's the level they want to, to work at, so that's, if that's where they're comfortable, is that where, that's where they feel like they're pushing themselves, that's awesome. We can go a bit further out when you're ready. You can slowly work your way out. But the other fantastic thing is look at this group. We've got a few people right on the inside, so right in the shallow bit, and we've got people out the back. So we can have a group of different abilities, still experiencing having fun together, celebrating each other's wins. That was something we were always a bit worried about. It's like, are the guys at the back going to feel like they're better? But actually, often the people who take to it quicker are the first people to celebrate when the guys and girls are taking a little bit longer, um, achieve, achieve the, the things they set out to achieve. 
And the other great thing about surfing is um, it's not like clearly it's an expressive sport. You know, there's this constant question, is surfing an art form or a sport? I'm, I don't think about it that much. I just know it's a lot of fun. Um, there's just a few pictures here. This is all surfing, you know. Um, the, the picture at the top from Liberia where I did some work, and that's the reason I really struggle with weightless controls up there because the people on the weightless just make their own surfboards and go surfing. Um, but yeah, you know, it shows you that even when there's not the means, people can, can do this thing. You know, this is, a, this is a surfer down the road in Dunbar, you know, doing that's like high performance surfing. That guy has competed at, at levels. You've got the kids up the top there in South Africa on their bellies. That's fine as well. That's still surfing. They're achieving what they're setting out to achieve. The coaches have helped them ascertain what goals they want to set and achieve it and celebrate it. Um, this is all surfing. Even this guy at the bottom here, that's me. Um, a lot of sand about to go up my nose there. That's just down the road as well. You know, it's all surfing. So surfing certainly does lean itself to being a safe space, you know, but without that safe space, what I will also stress is that surfing is not always a safe space. Um, there is research out that's demonstrated that the lineups, that's the, the water where we surf, is sexist, it's racist, um, it's uh, meansist. I think there's a better way of saying that. Um, but it's been demonstrated in robust research that these things all exist. So without our safe space, if we're sending people out into that, do you think they're going to keep it up? Do you think they're going to get the benefits that we see? And just a quick note, this is a gentleman called Clay Marzo, who is one of the best surfers in the world. He has autism, um, and uh, he doesn't like to compete, because why would he surf in rubbish waves for 20 minutes when he can go down the road and surf for six hours in better waves? I mean, that's, that's just common sense, isn't it? Um, he's doing there a maneuver called a, a clayback, which is a maneuver that's been named after him because he's one of the only people in the world who can do it. Um, and believe it or not, so he's going to come out of that riding on two feet and probably go off and do another one. Um, incredible, incredible athlete. Do look him up if you, if you have a minute. And then we're going to sort of drift into stuff that you're probably more, especially as educators, you're more aware of, and that's more established self-efficacy theory. Um, and this is an example of one of the other mediators that, that we discussed. You know, um, I love the very bottom one. That's very simple. You know, I went surfing and did that. If I can do that, I can do this other thing that's scary. I mean, it's the most beautifully simplistic demonstration of sort of self-efficacy that exists. But all of this is only possible if we get that physical and emotional safe space right. So back to here. Is it about the surfing? Surfing's all right. It's good. You know, you can do it. You, it's relatively easy to do it at your, your own pace. You know, all these things. But what's really making this picture not so worrying for me is I know he's in that physical and emotional safe space. I know there's a volunteer nearby who's going to help him if that board pops over his head. I know he's you know, got someone to talk, talk it through about. I know there's probably been some psychoeducation built into that session that's really helping him. And that a great example is um, a lot of the guys use sort of breathing and emotional regulation breathing techniques. And they teach it to the guys and girls and encourage them when they're in the water and they have their wipeout to use those emotional regulation techniques. How often do you get to teach something and then practice it in response to a real world stressor? It doesn't matter how, I've been surfing for 15, nearly 20 years now. When the water goes over my head, my heart rate still spikes. I can't control that. So it's a perfect opportunity to work on emotional regulation, psychoeducation like that. You know, once we know all that's going on, this picture's a little bit less worrying, isn't it? And I just want to sort of come to a point. The International Surf Therapy Organization, if you're not based in Scotland, um, please do look these guys up, and you can find out about amazing organizations all over the world um, that you can sort of find out more about or get involved in. Um, but I just want to, this is a definition that, that came out recently from the International Surf Therapy Organization. Surf therapy is defined by ISTO as a method of intervention that combines surf instruction, surfing, and structured individual and or group activities to promote physical, psychosocial, and psychological well-being. The key word there is the structure. The surfing is just the vehicle. And that's where I think we should be talking about development through sport, mental health through sport, not sport for development. The sport is just the vehicle. And even the sports that we traditionally think are the hardest to turn into these kinds of vehicles can be done. I've seen incredible stuff being done in rugby, which, again, I'm very passionate about. But on the surface, rugby is one of the hardest sports to adapt, to take away that competitive element, you're running each other full pelt. But there are organizations doing incredible things. And the reason for that is you've got researchers like me working on these, these sort of concepts and then sitting down with rugby coaches. 
because rugby coaches know their game better than I can ever know it, as much as I like to shout that I know it all at the TV on the weekend. But they know it. If we can explain these concepts and work with them to develop these adaptations, we really can use sport in the best possible way. I'm just going to leave you with just a comment. Um, as I mentioned in my positionality, I do a lot of work around mental health and actually a lot of work around sort of traumatic areas, uh, post-conflict zones. There's a, if you work in any kind of trauma-informed area, you will have heard of this book already. It's a book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bezel van der Koch. And he says in that, being able to feel safe for people is probably the most single important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. My PhD said that in a much rougher around the edges manner, but it's so true. And not only do we need to continue to do research to support this, but we need to start taking this seriously. When I've put this sort of stuff up, none of you were surprised. You know, I wasn't saying anything revolutionary, but we need to action it now, and we need to make sure that our beaches, our schools, our sports fields all become physical and emotional safe spaces so that people of all facing all kinds of challenges, whether that's through trauma, in the case of um, what Bezel works in, or you know, inclusion in terms of neurodiversity, whatever it may be, we need to take this concept of physical and emotional safe spaces seriously if we really want to see change. Yeah. That's me, thank you very much. This is the surface version, just so you know. <laughs> it's not a gang sign, I promise. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is joining us again now. Um, just a reminder, um, if you have any questions, please submit them uh, via the app or just let me know if you'd like to ask them on the microphone. So, ready for a few questions? Let's go. Um, okay, I think starting with Alyssa, we've had a lot of questions about this. Um, I think you'll not be surprised. Any plans for secondary school um, leans? And there was also a similar question... Uh, I guess more generally about other settings, so settings that are exclusively for neurodivergent um, children as well. Thank you for asking the first question I get at every single talk. <laughs> um, we don't have anything concretely in the works. We have tried applying for some funding, but have had, it's been a difficult sell. People want something novel rather than saying, it looks like a you've got a model that's been successful, let's expand it and do it again. So we haven't give up, given up, but we don't have anything concretely in the works. Um, there is a little bit of further advice on the website where we've uh, written some FAQs, people asking how might it transfer to this setting or that setting, um, and listing some things you might want to consider if you're asking those questions about your own setting. Thank you. OK, a question for you, Jamie, now. Um, actually, a comment first. What an amazing job you have. <laughs> I would all agree. Um, such important work to provide robust evidence and understanding uh, very powerful, thank you. Okay, but uh, um, a question too. Um, what does sport add to this kind of therapy if the important aspect is the safe space? Is it any different from something like art therapy? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, oh, actually, that's interesting. Through the curveball in there. <laughs> no, I am, I am actually a complete advocate for art therapy, music therapy. We really need to explore what vehicles work for different people. Um, and actually, even uh, I'm currently uh, in review for another paper with a, one of the organizations from Australia that I work with. And when we're looking at respite from mental health, we even need to try and offer multiple pathways to that within programs. Because one of the biggest predictors for mental health, uh, general human flourishing, is actually preference in terms of, we, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted at this <laughs> conference, but we're all, you know, we all work in slightly different ways, and we have different preferences. And trying to shoehorn someone into something that we, through often flawed methodology, think is the way to fix something is not. So absolutely, um, I think we need to be, you know, firstly, we do need to make sure we take these safe, space, safe spaces seriously. We need to actually not just, it can't be a blasé comment. It needs to stop being every keynote we've had They've spoken about that teacher, haven't they? Or that sports coach. We need to make that sports coach all sports coaches. We need to, and there's so much around that, around the, um, about uh, uh, awareness and, and building knowledge as well as, um, as well as. Getting people to buy in. Exactly. So th there's a lot of work to be done around that. But in terms of like art, absolutely. Music, absolutely. Um, there's some interesting stuff from the mental health side around respite. So these activities can often give, give you respite from your uh, negative symptoms. And we're doing some research on the moment that one of the, one of about three different pathways we've seen is around flow states, potentially accessing mm -hmm. flow states. And while sport is one avenue to access a flow state, 
music and art have been demonstrated to be very effective ways of, of accessing it for other people too. So. Thank you. Okay, um, questions are coming thick and fast, so I think maybe some might be for, um, for after the presentation. Um, but question for you, Alyssa. Um, through LEANS, did it help? Um, did you get feedback from school that it helped some children realise they were neurodivergent? So this is a, another question we've had before, and we did not specifically collect information about this, um, partly because given the circumstances around COVID, we needed to be super selective about what we asked schools to do and collect to run the study at all and make it feasible. Um, so we didn't, we didn't specifically collect information about that, but I think that would be a really interesting future study um, if we could get the appropriate permissions from people involved to see if those conversations were starting to happen at school or at home. So sorry to disappoint you by not having data about that now. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Jamie. Um, a question about um, issues of um, class and disadvantaged families and how those um, are, are conquered. Um, how do you bring in those, those families? I mean, again, I think it's about knowledge of those barriers. Um, one of the panels I was at was talking, one of the big topics was the concept of barriers to accessing healthcare. And it's the same for community-led interventions. You know, you really need to look at what are the barriers. You know, um, the WAVE project are a great example in that they identified one of the main barriers is people just getting to the beach. So as part of their funding model, they fund transport for every child to the beach and back as they need it. You know, so it's not reliant on the parents being able to do it. That sounds like such a simple thing. But in terms of the barriers that's broken down for who's able to participate, it's absolutely massive. Um, so again, it kind of goes back to the point I said, it's about population specific tailoring. It's about engaging your population in the process of developing or optimizing your intervention. You really need to go to people and ask what, what is getting in the way. And sometimes it can be, I mean, this is just a common thing in research. Sometimes it can be hard to get that buy-in, mm. um, but hopefully, hopefully, well, in surfing's case, hopefully it's cool enough um, it, that is an asset in terms of doing surfing research. The kids tend to think it's cool. Um, but yeah, and it's absolutely just about knowing those barriers. And often they are, there are ways to do it. If you can argue robustly, we had to argue with our funders why we were paying for taxis. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine what a funder would say to that. And we said exactly what you've just asked in that question is like, well, do you want to exclude probably some of the kids who could get the most benefit out of this? And the funder turned around and went, good point. <laughs> There you go. So, um, yeah, it's a really important question and, and needs to be a part of intervention design at all stages. Thank you. OK, Alyssa, back over to you. Question now about school management. OK. So um, I guess a question around whether there tend to be issues of sort of buy in from school management, thinking about all the priorities mm -hmm. and in the curriculum and so on. Um, what's been your experience there? Um, I think this is going to be quite a mixed bag in terms of having conversations with lots of different people. We've got situations where we may have teachers who are keen and think this is really important and management who are kind of going, I don't know, why are we talking about this? We may have management who are like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for, let's do it. Talking to staff who are going, I don't know, we already do it this way. Um, and I think this really comes back to the buy-in that we've mentioned, that this is so absolutely key, is to find the what's in it for you. Like, what is the key that's gonna open that door in your school, your local authority, whatever? And from talking to the educators who enrolled on our Champions program, they reported really different priorities um, in different areas of the UK. In some areas, they said, well-being, this is super important, and if we go in and talk about this in terms of well-being, we're gonna get people's attention to try to have a more detailed conversation. Others were like, that's a dirty word, we can't say well-being, they, <laughs> they will just run us out of the room. But if we talk about this in terms of, um, you know, dealing with some, some other issue, whatever the priority was in their issue, in, in their area, they were likely to get a hearing. So this is this has to have a local answer. You know, different areas, different individual schools, different individual leaders are not gonna have the same priorities. So during the Champions program, I talked to people a lot about looking at the landscape in your situation and making a plan for how you wanna make that approach um, to get to that first conversation. 
and to also keep in mind that talking about something like leans is really quite pointless if you're talking to someone who doesn't really know what neurodiversity is or isn't convinced that it has anything to do with education or think it's a problem for somebody else's school. So this is really a long distance race and talking about any specific program uh, or bringing in speakers or reading certain books um, might actually be several steps down the line. There may be other conversations that you need to have first for somebody to be ready to have, have that conversation. So there is no one magic formula, but I think it's gonna be always pretty good advice to try to make a bit of a map of who cares about what in terms of decision makers and gatekeepers and to try to come up with a message that's gonna speak to those existing concerns and priorities. I think we heard this a bit yesterday too, is people like, oh, neurodiversity is new. Well, obviously it's not. Um, <laughs> obviously it's not new. Um, and it really links very, very closely to lots of things that organizations are already trying to do if we help people see the connections. We can't assume the connections are obvious. Go ahead and spell them out. Thank you very much, Alyssa. Okay, and just as we finish, one final question, which I think I can answer, is um, are universities including this in initial teacher education? Yes, we are. You are! <laughs> yes. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Katie, that's so, great. I'd like to finish by thanking uh, both of our speakers, Alyssa Alcorn from the Salvinson Mine Room Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh, and Jamie Marshall from Edinburgh Napier University. Thank you all. And please visit us at Research Cafe if you'd like to hear more about Leans. We also have a couple of lovely helpers with some leaflets at the door if you want to scan the QR code and go to our site. Thank you.